Okay, I'm going to be introducing our new speaker, Dr. Noggle. Dr. Noggle is a 92 University of Waterloo Optometry grad. He is a past president and registrar of the New Brunswick Association of Optometrists. He practiced in the Moncton area where their clinics became one of the founding practices of FYI doctors in 2008. Dr. Noggle served as vice chairman of the FYI board of directors for its first seven years. Currently, as Vice President of Optometric Partners for FII Doctors, he oversees Canadian optometry growth and OD recruitment. Dr. Noggle, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Niam. So, um, yeah, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. And uh, certainly, even though you may not think it, 1992, uh, I know what it was like when I heard of people that many years before I graduated, but um, I do remember being there as well, certainly not in that uh, that auditorium, but the other one, of course, uh, in the main building. Um, so tonight, really, the, the, this, the purpose of my um, talk today is really how does practice geography impact OD's uh, compensation? And this is a much more, I would call it practical conversation. Um, I will say also that um, that's something I can imagine is on your minds. Uh, I I, uh, you know, know that you guys have a, a large amount of uh, student debt and, you know, these are the kind of questions that maybe you don't always have conversations about. So I like to really make sure that uh, it's going to be a very practical kind of approach to this and some of the things, some of the factors that go into it. Um, what I will say is uh, ties a little bit into uh, what both, so both, both Sophia and Robbie said. Robbie actually makes me feel uh, not very experienced. Uh, so that's good. Thanks in one way. I don't maybe feel as is old Robbie, but you said 1500 practices. I've only done maybe over 400 or so. Uh, and then Sophia talked about, uh, you know, asking questions. I think that really ties into something that I'm going to be talking about a lot. And also the quotes about being humble, you know, lifelong learning. For me, uh, there is no uh, special, special knowledge. It's just uh, being a lifelong learner and 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 adding experience, uh, you know, basically creates knowledge and to some degree. And so this is really what, you know, where it comes from as far as what how I can speak to this topic. So the other thing I'll say as a disclaimer is that, um, you know, the number one thing I think that's important for practice, and it goes a little bit to what Sophia said as well, in regards to, you know, are you going to be a good fit as culture? Number one, by far. So yes, you know, compensation is important. And I know you guys are hungry for some of that information. That's why I was, you know, pleased to do this. But first, I'll say that I was very um, clinically engaged when I was in school. I was very much uh, interested in the clinical side and, and was all my career. Um, so for me, you know, I actually didn't think a lot about money. I, I just wanted to be a good optometrist and, and to, con, you know, you know, provide really quality eye care and, and, uh, and be involved in the profession. And then, you know, money took care of itself, thankfully, but, um, that really this, this whole idea of cultural alignment is number one. So collaboration, are the doctors collaborative? Uh, what are their, what are your professional goals? What are their professional goals to what she said? Is there technology that's going to match? Are they willing to, you know, bring in technology? What's the patient base look like? Uh, and is there an opportunity for partnership and ownership at some point if you want it, which you may or may not want to? So that's number one. That's a disclaimer. So we'll jump into the actual compensation stuff. So how does compensation be impacted by geography? Well, from a big picture at 25,000 feet, there's a difference between U.S. and Canada. I'll say that. I've spoke to many students over the years uh, in, in the university uh, of schools of optometry across both Canada and the U.S., and what I will say is that they are built differently for compensation in general, for especially newer grads coming out. In the States, most doctors are paid on a salary uh, aspect, and that's because it's driven by the fact that health benefits are very expensive in the U.S. They are not in Canada, and therefore in the U.S. you want to be an employee, so you have health benefits covered for you. Um, and also in Canada, less need for to be employee because of that health benefit issue that's public, uh, publicly funded, but also in Canada, the tax laws are in favor of you being an independent contractor. So what I will say is that there is a misconception that when doctors or optometrists pra uh, graduate uh, in the States, they feel that they're going to stay in the States to to make more money is what I've heard multiple, multiple times. And that's because they, there's a perception of that. It's true because it's a dollar amount. It's a certain dollar amount that you're given either per day or per year. And therefore it's very concrete. It's not abstract. Uh, when you're paid on models in Canada uh, of a, as an independent contractor, it's harder to um, conceptualize or to forecast what is that dollar amount gonna be. But we've done lots of valuations for practices in both Canada and the US. 
Um, and we are in California in the U.S., so we've done some of those. And I'll say that based on this, 15 to 18% of gross billings is what a typical U.S. associate doctor makes, whereas in Canada, that's that's a larger amount. So, so I wanted to kind of just put that out there and how why there are differences as far as the comp models and the fact that, you know, it's there's a bit of a myth in the fact that you can make more money in the U.S. Uh, variance of Canadian provinces. So definitely variations from province to province. Uh, highest average in income is, you, is, in, the, is in Saskatchewan. Uh, and Ontario, probably in the lower provinces per se. But again, this is average. There are lots of doctors that make very good incomes in Ontario. Uh, don't get me wrong, but there's some there's some factors there again with the Ontario problems in the past with dispensing models um, and that and your OHIP uh, fees and what they pay. As we all know that what that's about, that has been some downward pressures on you know what Ontario optometrists make. Um, and then there's other factors. My home province, New Brunswick, has no coverage. So at first you go, that's not very good. And it's not in, in, the, in the case of the patient. Uh, in the case of the doctor, they're able to basically, you know, charge whatever fee they want for whatever procedure they have. So there's pros and cons of that, both for the public and for the optometrist. And then urban versus rural. And this is going to be a big factor. So you'll see what, what I'll talk about as far as how does that urban rural impact the comp models in Canada. So first, we need to understand how do, how do Canadians get compensated? Uh, how do Canadian ODs get compensated? And it's really, for the vast majority of offices, especially outside of Ontario, a pretty common uh, format is a percentage of your total gross billing. So that's all services and all products for patients seen. So if I see a patient as Dr. Mike Noggle, then all the, all the services I bill for that patient, whether it be visual fields, the exam, OCTs, anything at all, and also any product that patient buys, then, then I get a certain percentage of that. And I said earlier, it ranges anywhere. Typically, I mean, it can be outside of those ranges, but typically that ranges around in around 20, 24%. Uh, in Ontario, a very, a very common formula that you'll still see kind of hanging out there is 50% of the professional fees and 50% of the profit of dispensing. So the markup portion, not the total gross of the pair of glasses, which is what it's like in the rest of Canada. And again, the reason why they had that is because there was a dispensing model. So they had this, you know, you showed the patient how much do you actually cost for the frame, and then you actually had the markup that you showed separately. It wasn't all put together like it is for the rest of the country. They have since changed that in Ontario, but you would, uh, I would say there's still a large percentage of offices that use that dispensing model format. Uh, and so more and more offices, as, as Ontario is moving away from that dispensing fee model, uh, more and more offices are going to, uh, partners are going to a percentage of gross billings. And then, then there's a kind of a hybrid of the above and kind of a mix and match of all those things. So what's the pillars in compensation? So compensation really breaks down into three main pillars. What you get paid is going to be impacted by number one, and these are prioritized. Number one, fill rate. And so what I call bums in chair, BIC, uh, it's how many patients you're going to see. Number one, if you have two patients you're seeing per day, it's absolutely going to limit what you're going to make. It doesn't matter what percentage you're going to be paid. That's going to be a problem. Uh, gross revenue generated per full exam. So how you know that is basically take all the full exams that you've seen, divide by the total number of revenue that you've generated for that day, that week, that month, that year, and divide by the full exams. And that is your revenue per full exam. And that ranges quite a bit. Again, we've done lots of lots of uh, practices as far as valuation across Canada, and I've seen that range from as low as two hundred dollars per full exam. And remember, this is all product and services uh, to as much as five hundred, five fifty per full exam. So ranges quite a bit. So you can see the very very large difference there. And then the and the, and the third in, uh, component of it is what percentage you're being offered. But that's actually the least impactful, believe it or not, of all three. So. When we go into fill, uh, fill rate, what I called again, bum and chairs, uh, it's the single biggest component by far. So those are the things that are impacting it. Um, you know, really the big thing is, are you being offered a chair or a chair time or are you being offered, you know, patients themselves? Because in, in, in some areas in Canada that are no more known for it than others, I, I'll call out GTA for it a little bit more. It's, I don't want to point fingers, but it's truth. Just in reality, there's a large kind of, you know, uh, competition for optometrists and so they'll often when they're talking about certain days they're talking about actual chair time not about patients um so dig in dig into those ask those questions again about you know how are you you know how are you how far are you booked out you know how are your recalls do you actually want an office that is behind in recalls because that's going to help you fill your patient base but then has a good recall system that will kick in after you come in. Um, so a, a strong kind of recall base and a, a strong recall system is gonna help you in your fill rate. And also how willing are they willing to 
and, and what 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 processes and how what uh, what uh, ways in which they're going to let you be booked up? Is it only new patients? Is it going to be patients that are booked beyond a certain period of time? Is every patient going to be offered an earlier appointment with the the new associate doctor? Those again, uh, to Sophia's point, those are questions that should be asked. Uh, the second one is revenue per full exam. Again, quite a range. I told you anywhere between you know two hundred to five fifty percentage is twenty to twenty four. I told you, but you know revenue per full exam. This is also very important. And this is impacted by a lot of things. What kind of technologies in the practice? What is the professional and retail pricing strategy? You know, what how do they how do they look at that? What's the levels of delegation? You know, the more delegation that occurs, then that means you as the doctor gets to spend more time doing what you're best at. If you're measuring, you know, seg heights and you're doing a bunch of different things as the doctor in the practice, which I still have seen in, in still existence, then you're going to be able to less do what you do and bill for what you're really good at, essentially. Um, level of training the staff and level of a retail attractiveness. Uh, you have to be very honest. If you were to walk in that practice, would you would you purchase your eye care and and eye wear uh, from that location? You know, you you got to look at it through the through the patient slash consumer's eyes. Again, the rural practices they have a tendency to have less competition. So you see here where the rural has can have sometimes an impact on revenue per full exam. Um, uh, saying that again, that's an that's an average statement because I've seen you know urban areas that can, you know, that are billing quite high revenue per full exam because they're doing all these things right. And I've seen some rural practices that don't generate that much revenue per exam because they're not doing these all things, these things right. But if everything is equal, then typically due to competition, you have a better opportunity uh, from compensation point of view in more of a rural or semi-rural environment. And then percentages used. Um, so really, you know, this can this can change a little bit or it can be based on different factors. If you've been out for a while, if you've practiced already in the kind of in a certain area or if you're going to bring in a certain patient base because of a specialty, then 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 you may be paid a different percentage. Um, and initially, when you have set exams, set amounts per exam, that's one other way that doctors are compensated. It, it feels a bit more attractive to you because it's, again, concrete. You can see what it is. But it's it's also um, a limiting factor because it's only about a certain amount per exam. So only way you can increase your uh, compensation is if you increase the volume of your exams. Whereas we go back to that percentage of your of your gross billings. Well, there's many different ways that you can impact your percentage of, of you know your total billings essentially. And then you know can ownership and buy in. Uh, can it impact this? And of course, most cases in traditional traditional practice, it certainly does. And then in some of the models that are not so-called traditional practices, it also does that as well. So, um, so this really uh, this percentage thing, it's important. But I've seen lots and lots of new grads coming out, and the first question they ask is, "Well, what's your percentage?" And you know, what's your percentage? That's because that's the only number that makes sense to them, and it's a number they can ask. And so they ask that, but I can tell you that that is the least important of the three. Not that it's not important, but it's the least important of the three by far. So to show this, then this is evaluating opportunities. The first, the first one I would use as a great example of probably a U.S. Uh, associateship opportunity. It's a salary position, four hundred fifty dollars per full day, five days per week, forty-seven weeks per year, and earnings is one hundred and five thousand dollars when you work the math out. Uh, situation number two, 24 percent, top range of that range that we talk, that kind of general, you know, guidelines of what that may look like. That practice generates three hundred twenty-five dollars uh, average per full exam, eight exams per day, five days per week, forty-seven weeks per year. You have one hundred forty-four thousand. Let's go to the the opportunity that maybe look the least on paper, especially based on the one question you may ask. Is twenty-one percent of gross? But this practice generates $50 more per exam based on all those things we talked about, whether it's technology, delegation, better, you know, better retail presence. Um, so 12 exams per day, another four, five days per week. Look at the difference in the compensation. So those are the things that you should be asking about. If compensation is a concern of yours, which, again, I'm, it's always going to be a factor, uh, then this, these are some of the questions that, that are key to be asking, um, you know, the, the offices you go into. Again, the disclaimer, I think there's, there's some other real key important things above that, but I've been asked to talk about, you know, ge you know compensation in general and just geographically how that impacts that. So I'll wrap up by saying that really the profession of optometry, 
Um, I think you've chosen wisely. It's been an absolute blessing to myself and my family. My uh, wife is an optometrist. We met in class at Waterloo. Uh, we, our son-in-law, uh, is some of you would know on the call here, our pseudo son-in-law. They're not married yet, but they've been going out for nine years. Our, my pseudo son-in-law, I call him, uh, he is fourth year at NECO. Uh, so Julian Marcus. So we're, we're seeing to be blessed because he'll be, you know, taking over my wife's practice and and uh, so again, it's been a blessing to my to our family, and uh, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything different. And I wish you all the best um, in your coming years.